Good morning and welcome to the Gospel of this morning. We are in the first letter of Peter and we're coming to the third part today. And I would like to start with a scripture reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 from verse 8 onwards. Whom having not seen you love, in whom though you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Well, the first uh, subtitle we have, Whom having not seen yet, you believe. We ended our last study with the words, At the appearing of Jesus Christ. The world says, how can you love a person that is unseen? Yes, the world is incapable to love God because their hearts are in darkness. We, on the other hand, are responding to God's love for us. The kind of love He has and is showing to us goes beyond human reasoning. We may not see Jesus with our natural eyes, but we, we cannot form a picture of Him in our mind, really. But faith has overcome this limitation, and we see in part and read the biblical description recorded in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13 and, and, and verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Or in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13 to 16, there we have a description of the glorified Christ. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were like wool white, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Well, this is all that we know about his appearance, a feeble attempt to describe something about the glorified Christ. Yet by the Holy Spirit our heart rejoices when we think about him and his love towards us bounces back to him. Though you see him not yet believing you rejoice, Peter says, only a born-again spirit in us can have a measure of understanding of what Peter is trying to bring across. The, the knowledge of our salvation creates a tremendous reaction in us. The world around us looks blankly at us when we bubble over, when, when, when talking about Jesus. They, they have the same reaction to this as the mockers displayed on the day of Pentecost. There is something wrong mentally with you or you are drunk with sweet wine. That's what they say. Ah, this is what my friends thought when I came to Jesus. Ah, oh, give him time, he will come right down again to earth from his cloud, cloud seven. I, I never did. And some sadly have already departed from this world in unbelief. Well, yet believing ye rejoice is quite a statement. How can we rejoice and jump for joy about something that has not happened yet and cannot be touched or observed at least in the shop window? The reward is so big and without any physical investment that only a total fool would not investigate its possible validity. And here lies the problem for the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. 
For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. They think we are of low IQ because the cross makes no sense to them. Paul carries on in the same tone and he writes in verses 19 to 21, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Oh, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Absolutely incredible. What is my advice to the unbeliever? Well, call on the name of the Lord. And, and, and see if he's not willing to be tested, as he said in, in, in the prophet Malachi, uh, chapter 3 and verse 10, it says there, And prove me now herewith, yes, prove me now, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Well, men are struggling in this world. And it's so easy, why don't they call upon the name of the Lord and see and test him now if he's not really true. Yeah. But Peter goes on, he says, with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There are three different levels here. There's joy. Well, joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is a, uh, a permanently established character trend in a believer. But when joy has left us, we need to take stock and we ask ourselves, who's robbing us of it? Is it the devil or, or, or the world or even other believers? Th then we deal with it. If it is the devil, we rebuke him in the name of Jesus and oppose him by the blood of Jesus. If it is the world, well, we simply have to realize that we are too much in it still. Well, is it the church that destroys my joy? Well, then it is time to leave. The joy is my barometer of faith and salvation. That's what I believe. And then we have joy unspeakable. The heart is deeply touched through an event and we are overwhelmed for a moment. It, it, it can be because of an act of kindness or a revelation by the word of God, a song or a psalm, even a healing, divine healing, a, a deliverance from oppression, etc. Nevertheless, it will subside and settle into a space of that permanent joy of fruitfulness. Well, the third one is the joy full of glory. It is when God the Holy Spirit comes to visit and puts his hand on our shoulder. It is what we call a hagio moment when word and spirit pays us a visit. Let's see it from scripture. Revelation 1, chapter 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And, and, and he laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last. It, it happened when the prophet Isaiah when the temple was full of the glory of God and he cried out in Isaiah 6, 5, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It happened three times in my own experience. Sinful flesh cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. It, it makes us totally uncomfortable and we want to go away. Yet, yet, yet people constantly pray for it, not knowing what they ask for. During the Welsh revival, uh, uh, people were drawn by an unseen hand into the churches, then clinging to the pillars, pleading with God for mercy because they were made aware of their sinful nature, being confronted with the Holy Spirit, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul, says Peter. Faith comes to an end when hope is becoming a reality. That end for us is the permanent state of our salvation when nothing can change that status. Now we can still backslide. We have it. 
people make a start with the Lord Jesus and then a little while later they cool down and eventually fall away. Often it is people who create in their mind their own savior and eventually this shepherd cannot live up to the word of God. The demands that the real Jesus makes on them are just too hard. Well, I, I made a painting on this subject called The Painted Shepherd. You, you can paint him well, your own way and you, you can hang him wherever you wish. Uh, the true shepherd, he gives his own life for the sheep and the heathen creates an idol and the wolf is coming to eat the sheep, the true shepherd. He carries the sheep and the lambs on his shoulder when they're tired. And this is the real Jesus. Until next time, God bless you. Amen.